Hey everybody, Dave here. Today I'm gonna to do something a little bit different. Instead of coming up with my own use case for what I wanna build in Power Automate Desktop, I'm gonna take a comment that I got a couple months ago on a video. Uh, Robert, uh, I'm probably gonna butcher this name, so you know, let's just accept that. Robert Gerslack, is that right? Let me know, Robert, if you see this, if that was correct. But Robert suggests to make a pad flow that queries SQL Server and then puts the data into Excel and then takes that data from Excel and sends it as an email that's HTML formatted through Outlook. I went ahead and built that actually a couple of months ago. Now, I didn't make a video about it because, well, I get busy sometimes. I'm ready to do it now. So I'm recording a video about that. It's not really my style to show you something that I've already built. That's just not fun for me. So I want to show you every step that I did like I normally do by just building it on screen. Recognize though that I've already done a lot of solutioning for this and a lot of Googling because that's what I do to figure out how to solve certain problems. So you may not see much troubleshooting in this video because I've already figured out those things. Thank you, Robert, for making the suggestion. So let's jump into the video. The way I'm going to do this is to build a single desktop flow with everything in it that I need to use. That means that we'll have several different subflows in that desktop flow. Just note that more than likely, I will eventually extract some of these subflows that we'll build and put them into their own desktop flows especially when I come across ones that I want to start reusing. Because it's so easy to copy and paste actions in Power Automate Desktop, I'm not really worried about building that reusable flow from the beginning because it's so easy to just move the logic over. So in this video, I'm going to build a flow that I'm calling use case, SQL, Excel, HTML table, email. And that's four parts right here, but we're actually gonna build it in five parts. We're first going to query SQL, then we're going to write the SQL data into Excel. Then we'll read the data back from Excel. Then we'll convert the Excel data into an HTML table. And then we'll put that HTML table into an email that we'll send to ourselves through Outlook. So let's go ahead and create this flow. I know that I want five parts to this. So I'm going to go ahead and create the individual subflows. And then I'm going to build in each of those subflows one at a time. And you can kind of expect that this video will follow that flow as well. And you can use the chapters feature of YouTube to kind of skip to whichever one you'd like to see. The first subflow will be query SQL server. So let's go ahead and create that. Query SQL server. Can't put any spaces in these. The second one will be write to Excel. The third will be read from Excel. The fourth will be convert data table to HTML table. And then the fifth subflow will be send HTML email. This is the order in which I'm going to develop these query SQL server, write to Excel, read from Excel, convert data table to HTML table, and then send HTML email. Because I'm pretty much the worst about doing this, I'm gonna go ahead and start by adding these subflows onto the main flow so that they actually get called when I run my tests. I've seen that myself do that in past videos. I'll just completely forget to add a subflow reference to it. <laughs> so let's type subflow over in the actions, drag this over here, and then I'm gonna call query SQL server first. I'm gonna copy and paste the same action and then just change the parameter to write to Excel. The next thing we want is to read from Excel. Then we want convert data table to HTML table. And the last one is send HTML email. I'm going to save this. What this does for me now is whenever I run my tests, it's going to run one subflow after another. And if I haven't put anything, let's say, into send HTML email, then it'll just run over that subflow and do nothing. So I'll just run this and show you that it's just going to run over all of the subflows and do nothing at all. And that's what I want. So I have build something into the first subflow, then it'll run those actions, and then it'll do nothing after that. And that sounds perfect. So we've got ourselves set up now. Let's go from subflow to subflow and build out the logic that we need. Let's go into our query SQL server subflow. Let me mention a couple things that I have done as a pre-setup kind of thing. It may be a little difficult to reproduce this. I can't really show all the steps for this because I'm certainly not an expert in doing these things. 
What I did was I installed SQL Server a long time ago on my machine. So there was a SQL Server instance already running. If you need to do that, you can probably just download SQL Server and install it. You'll also want to download SQL Server Management Studio so that you have a user interface that you can use to manipulate the SQL Server instance and the databases inside of it. And what I did was I created a new database called RPA Challenge. So this is the name right here. And then once I'd done that, I just needed to create a table. So I used the import functionality in SQL Server Management Studio, and I went to the RPA Challenge website, right? Downloaded the Excel spreadsheet that they have there, and I changed that to a CSV file, imported it in here, and it auto-created a table for me, and I named it Challenge. Here's the data set over on the right. It's exactly what you'd expect. There's 10 rows of data with a bunch of fields like first name, last name, etc. And we will query this table and take that data, convert it into HTML, and send it in an email. Back over in our subflow for Query SQL Server, let's go to the actions on the left side and just type SQL. And we're going to need these three actions. So let's start with Open SQL Connection so that we can connect to our SQL Server instance. Now, if you already have a connection string or a DBA gives you a connection string, you can just paste it right here. You can do this for Microsoft Access, Microsoft Excel, SQL Server. I'm just gonna show you something super basic. I have that SQL Server instance running locally, so it's pretty easy. I'm gonna click Build Connection String, and then there's a whole bunch of choices here. I know that I'm working with SQL Server, so I'm gonna choose Microsoft OLEDB Provider for SQL Server. Let's click Next, and then uh, for the server name, I'm going to type the name of my machine. My SQL Server instance, I guess, is named after my machine. So we're typing the name of my machine here, effectively. And then I'm going to click Use Windows NT Integrated Security, so I don't have to type in a username and password. So this account that I'm on right now created that database, so I assume I just basically have rights to it. And then the database on the server, I'm going to type RPA Challenge. That's the name of the database that we saw inside of SQL Server Management Studio. And I'm going to click Test Connection. Test Connection succeeded. If you have problems with this, welcome to the club. I had a lot of problems trying to get this to work. And then what ended up working in the end was actually something super simple. And it looked just like this. Feel free to comment if you're having any difficulty and I can try to help. But I'm just not an expert in various connection strings. But I'm certainly willing to try. I'm going to click OK. Click Save. And then we're going to execute a SQL statement that is rather simple. Note that it's using the SQL connection uh, variable that came out of our previous action. And I'm going to just type select star from challenge, right? So this is the name of my table. And the star just means pull all fields and all rows from that. I know there's only 10 rows. Ordinarily, you'd want to limit the number of rows you're getting from a table. But in this case, I just know that there's not that many. And I'm really just proofing out how would you query SQL Server, not how would you do complicated things. So I'm going to click Save. And then let's close the SQL connection. It's already got the name of the variable for the SQL connection that I want. And I'm going to click Save. And that's it. So let's go ahead and run this and make sure it works. It'll open the SQL connection, execute that basic SQL query, and then close the connection. And, you, and then if I look over to the right, I've got the query result. I can double click on that. And it shows all of the columns that we saw in the table and 10 rows of data. All right, let's go back up to the main flow. Next, let's go into the Write to Excel subflow. Here, we're going to work with Excel actions. So let me go down to that section. Okay, this is going to turn out to be a little more complicated than I'd like it to be. But let's start off with the simple stuff. We need to launch Excel. We can launch with a blank document. That makes sense. We are going to make the instance visible just in case we need to troubleshoot. And then we'll click Save. Before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and close Excel. Here's the variable that was output from up here. And we are going to write to Excel. So we do want to save the document. And we're actually going to save it to a specific location. We want to save it to. Uh, actually, before I do this, let's. Let's go ahead and put a, the name of a variable that I'm going to create and I haven't yet created. File path. Let's save that. And then up in the input output variables area, I'm going to click the plus sign, click input. Let's name this file path. And we'll put this down here too for the external name. 
We're not actually going to call it from anywhere external at the moment, but you know, in case we did, this is what it would be called. And then there's going to be a data type of text. The default value is the important part here. I'm going to put C colon backslash test backslash pad query, and then backslash, we'll call this SQL underscore data dot XLSX. Create. Okay, so now we've got our file path that just kind of exists as a default variable that we can use throughout the rest of this. This is a global variable, so it doesn't matter what subflow we're working in, we'll be able to access that. Okay, so when we launch Excel, it's just going to launch Excel, blank document, we're going to end up putting something into it, then when we close Excel, it'll save to this file path. The next thing we want to do is write to Excel. So let's find the write to Excel worksheet action, drop this in the middle. And the value that we want to write is actually going to be this query result that we got from SQL Server. So let's put that in here. Query result. And we want to put this into column one, row one. I'm going to go ahead and run this so that you can see what happens. It's going to do everything again. It's going to run the SQL query and it will then write data into Excel and save it to this location. Right, so here's the Excel sheet that it created. And let's look at what it did. So you can see it wrote all the data correctly. The problem is it didn't bring over the table headers. And that was something that I just kind of left alone and I came back to it today and actually fixed this. Looking in the Power Automate desktop documentation, I found that what I can do is get the first row of this data table and find out what its properties are as far as column names and take those column names, put them into a list, iterate over that list and enter them one by one into the first row of the Excel worksheet. It sounds kind of complicated. It's not really that bad though. Let's go in here. Here's what we're going to do before we write this and actually let's change this. We know we're going to put the column headers into row one. So let's change the row number that we're going to write our data set to. And so we'll put this here, row number two, save that. And I'm actually gonna run it and just make sure it works properly. So we should see exactly the same thing as before, but this time the first row should be completely empty, allowing us to have a place where we can put all of our um, headers. And there we go. So that's gonna be empty. We're gonna write the data one by one into these header locations. All right, we're back into the subflow for write to Excel. So the first thing we got to do is get the column headers for the first rows. Let's use a set variable action. We're going to put this result into column headers. What do we want to set into this variable? Well, we need something from this query result. We want the first row. So let's do a open close square brackets with a one inside of it. And that should point to the first row of that data table. So now we've effectively got a data row out of this. Then we want to say dot column names. And so what should come out of this is a list of column names. Let's save that. And then we want to iterate over that list. So let's type for each into the actions, bring over a for each. And for each of the uh, for each of the column headers, we'll call each item just header. All right, so we need to write into the Excel worksheet. So let's copy and paste that up here. And what we want to write is not the query results, but instead the header. So there should be just the name of a single header in that and are we going to yeah we're going to write to a specified cell it's going to be column number that's this is what's going to change the column number and then the row is always going to be row number one so right we're going to write the first one to here then the second one to here but it's always going to be row number one and this is where we're going to put in a variable so let's call this column number and we haven't yet created this variable save. So let's go up and use a set variable action. And we are going to set this to be, uh, we're going to set column number to be one. All right. So it'll be one by the time it gets into this 
loop, the first time that is going to equal one. And we're going to write the very first value from the column headers into the first column of row one. The second time we want to write into column number two. So we've got to increment this value each time we do this loop. So let's copy. Actually, we can use, I don't know why there's an action for increase variable. Like how hard is it to do, to just use set variable and then, you know, do like a plus one, but whatever variable we want column number, we're going to increment it by one. Let's save this. And I think at this point we should be good to go. So let's run a test and make sure that it works. It's going to query SQL again. Then it'll open up Excel. This time it should be open longer on the screen and it'll show each of the column names being written to the first row. Then it writes the whole data set. And now we've got our data. Let's just open it up and make sure it looks correct. Select everything, double click on one of these. Looks perfect to me. Awesome. Okay, so let's close this. Let's open up the read from Excel subflow where we haven't done anything yet. And we are going to need to get data out of the same Excel that we just wrote data into. I should mention, of course, why would you do this? I just wrote the data into Excel. Why would I not just use the data I have already? Well, part of this is the idea of writing to Excel and then taking the data from Excel and sending it through Outlook. This may not be what Robert really intended when he suggested this, but my mind immediately jumped to that. So granted, you could write to Excel and also send through Outlook. And that's probably the better way to do it. But it just seemed like kind of a fun challenge to me to write to Excel and then read it from Excel. So it's kind of like a beginning to end kind of flow where each piece is dependent on the one before working correctly. I just wanted to explain that and why I'm not um, just taking the data from what I already have. Let's go over to the actions and find the Excel group. And we want to launch Excel. This time, instead of launching a blank document, we'll choose to open the following document. We're going to use the variable file path that we've already created up here. So we're working with the same file. We're going to make it the instance visible. In this case, we're going to open as read only because we don't need to make any changes this time. Let's click save. And then I always like to close before I do anything else. The Excel instance is, that is interesting. It didn't automatically enter. Oh, because there's two of them. Okay, Excel instance two. I did not notice that. Let me open up this and see. Okay, yeah. So this second launch Excel is using Excel instance two. The reason for that is that the variables are global across all of the subflows. If I split this up into separate desktop flows entirely, then we wouldn't have any conflicts between these. You could change this to not have a two in it. You could use the same Excel instance if they're not open at the same time. This is kind of prepping me for what if I wanted to use both Excel instances at the same time. But I'm going to go ahead and leave them as different. And then we're going to launch Excel. We're going to close that same instance. And then we need to read from Excel. So let's read from Excel worksheet. The Excel instance we want to use is Excel instance 2. The start column is going to be 1. Start row is going to be 1. Oh, wait, we need to change this to values from a range of cells. And our end column and end row are going to be coming from variables. So let me go ahead and save that for now. And let's go down and use our action. Get first free column and row from Excel worksheet. Choose the Excel instance number two. The variables that are going to come out of this are first free column and first free row. Save that. Now let's go back into read from Excel worksheet. And let's choose the variables. First free column. Make sure I match this up, column and column. And then first free row. And in this case, because it's going to give us the first empty column, then I want to subtract one so that we don't get an empty column. And then subtract one from the row so it doesn't give us an empty row. And this should effectively give us the range of cells that have values in them. So the next thing is in the advanced options. It gives us the choice. Do we want to declare that the first row contains the column names. I'm going to say yes, but technically if I wanted this to be easier, I would not leave this checked and I'll show you why when we get to it. The rest of the flow would be easier if I left this unchecked. I'm going to click save and this should work for us. Let's go ahead and test this and make sure that we can read the data 
into, where does it go? Excel data. So it should go into this variable right here. Getting data from SQL Server, writing the data to Excel. And then it's going to read the data from Excel into here. So let's make sure it looks right. We've got our column names and we have 10 rows of data. Looks good to me. Next, let's go into the subflow for convert data table to HTML table. This is going to be a fun one. Before we begin, let me just tell you, I recognize that there are other ways to do this. However, there's not that many ways to do it directly in Power Automate Desktop as native features of Pad. So uh, I could use PowerShell or Python for this same kind of thing, but I like to use the features the tool provides as a no code slash low code solution. So we're going to build based upon the actions available in Power Automate to build an HTML table. And really the only way I know of to do that is literally just build a string and you build the HTML how you know it should be structured. Let's start by creating a variable. We'll call it HTML and let's do a set variable. We will call this HTML. And then what we want to do is set this to kind of the first set of text that you would see if you looked at the HTML of a page. Now I'm going to cheat and I'm just going to paste right in here. Now I granted you could just Google this as well, uh, but I'm just going to paste in here what you would expect to see if an HTML page only contained a table. And this is just the first part of it. What you'd expect to see is the doc type and obviously the node for HTML to open that up. And then this is going to do a little bit of styles for the tables inside of this page. And then here's the body that we're starting. So we're going to build the body. This is not closed yet though. And then we're starting a table with a certain border and width. And then we're just going to tack on what we need to add the various data in the table close the table and then close the HTML at the end. Not really that complicated, but it looks awful. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to save this. We're going to start here and then we're going to just add some stuff to it. And we need to add the data from Excel into this HTML. So we're at some point going to have to loop over that data. Let's go ahead and do a for each loop. We're going to choose Excel data for each data row inside of this. I'm going to call it a data row. And then as we loop through each of the data rows, we want to, so think through this with me. If you need to add row by row from a data table into an HTML table, we can handle it row by row. So I'm going to use another set variable action to declare the beginning of our row. Let's take this out. We want to set this variable HTML. And then what we want to set it to is what HTML already had in it, which would be all of this stuff up here, plus TR for table row. And that's starting this table row. Then we are eventually going to close this. So I'm going to copy and paste it and change the second one to be exactly the same thing, but with a forward slash before TR to close the table row. Now between this, we have to loop through each of the columns in the Excel data. This is awesome, right? So let's use another for each, put that in the middle, and then let's choose data row. We'll name this column. And for each of the columns in the data row, we are going to use another set variable. Let's copy this one since it's already got HTML in it. Drag it inside this nested for each loop. So remember looping through the rows, looping through the columns here. We need table data, which means a column. Uh, or it's actually a cell, but you know, it's effectively creating a column for us or setting the value of a column. And then we want the value from the column. Oh, you know what? It'd probably be better to name this something like um, column value. So I'm going to, I'm going to rename that really quick. Column value for each column value. 
in the data row. Then we're going to put HTML and then table data to open the column, put the value, close the column, save. Then it's going to close the row at the end once it's added all of the columns. And then at the very end, we need to set a little bit of text at the very end to kind of close up everything. So we're going to put the HTML, right? Everything we've built up to this point and then close it by just appending a little bit of text. So we need to close the table. We need to close the body of the HTML and then close the entire HTML itself. Save that. And this should work as is, but I think we'll see that there's a little bit of an issue from this. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's run it and see how it does. All right, query SQL Server. It's writing the Excel file, wrote the data. Now it's reading back from that Excel file, and now we're looping through that data. This is going to take a little while, and here's where, let me kind of reference back to earlier when I said, this is probably not the best way to do this if you have a lot of data, and I knew specifically I wanted to have only a few rows, and that's because of this. Doing this in Power Automate Desktop, it's going to take forever for this to run if you're actually running it while you have the flow open. Now I can tell you right now, this runs a lot faster when you don't have the flow open. And I think I might actually just show you that really quick after this runs, but let's look at the data really quick. So, oh wait, this, okay. So this is the data set that we'd expect, but this is not what the HTML table is gonna look like. It's gonna be a little bit different. So let me go to the data for the HTML. Here's the HTML, right? Like crazy bunch of stuff. I'm just gonna select all of it. And we're gonna go into here in the same folder. I'm gonna create a file and just name it HTML table dot HTML. And we're creating a web page by doing this. I'm gonna open this in Notepad++, paste all that HTML, save it, close it. Now, if I open up this HTML page, here's what it looks like. Okay, so pretty good table, right? The problem is that there's no header for this. And while this might be good enough for somebody, I don't like it. And I couldn't leave it at this. I had to get the table header. This is where I was saying that if earlier when we read the data out of Excel, if we chose to tell it, oh, don't treat the first row as column headers, then we would actually see the column headers here because it would have left the column headers in the first row. We would have had 11 rows instead of 10 and the first row would be the headers. What I don't like about that though too, actually let's, uh, let's test that and I wanna show you the difference. Let me go over to read from Excel. Let's change this to read and then not, right? First line of range contains column names. Let's say that it doesn't. Click save and let's just run this thing again. While I run this again, let me save and then I'm gonna show you how much faster this runs when you don't have it open. All right, so we're gonna click, once this play button becomes available again, I'm gonna click it and it's gonna run a lot faster. All right, we're gonna click okay. This is my default location. I could change the file path. And it's done. <laughs> so clearly Power Automate Desktop runs plenty fast, even if you do a bunch of string manipulation like we did building that HTML, it's, it's plenty fast for, for doing that kind of stuff, but it's just very slow when you have it opened up in, you know, like the editor or debug mode, that's very, very slow. Let's go look at the um, data now. Let's see. The problem is, right, okay. So since I ran it like that, I don't have the HTML. So let me just run this one more time. And I'll probably just skip in the video uh, till after this is finished. And then we'll look at what the HTML looks like now. All right, it has finished running. So let's go over to the HTML and copy it. I'm going to just select all by doing control A, control C to copy it. And then I'm going to go back into that same thing I 
did earlier, delete all the HTML, paste the new HTML, save it, and then let's look at what it looks like now. Okay, so there. You can see that the table header is there, and this looks fine, I guess, but I want the page to understand that this is a table header, and it'll actually be like kind of bolded. All right, so we're going to go back in and change the option back. We're going to treat the first line as column names. And so, right, we're back to the point where if we wrote it out into HTML, then the, the header wouldn't be there at all. In here, what we're going to do is the same thing we did before with uh, writing to Excel. We're going to copy this concept where we got the column headers and use that over here when we convert to HTML table. Now, this time, I don't want to actually use the same variable that we did before. And so I'm going to go into this and actually just change it to be column headers two. And uh, in this case, we're also not going to use the query results. We want to use Excel data. And then we're using the first row of that Excel data. Actually, that's probably using the second row. I didn't think about that. Let's go fix it. I don't like that. Power Automate desktops running really slow, so let's close it and reopen it. Okay, so here where I, I put a one inside of this to reference the first row, I think I, I actually want zero here so I can reference the first row. I think putting a one references the second row, and that just makes me feel bad, so we're going to do this. And then I'm going to go back up over to what we're working on for converting a data table to HTML. Now, just like we did a for each when we wanted to add each of the data in the columns down here, we're going to do a very similar thing uh, up here, and we're going to do it for the table header just one time, though. So for each of the values in this column headers list that comes out of the first row uh, for the column names from the first row of Excel data, then we can um, append that into the HTML and then move on. So let's actually bring this Let's bring this down and do ourselves a for each. We want to loop over the list, column headers two, and we'll call this a header two. And then inside of this, we want to grab one of these set variable stages, drag it up here, and we are going to, of course, use the HTML that exists already, and then we're going to append table header, and then put the value header two, and then close it like that for table header with the forward slash before it. Save that, and then this should do everything that we need. So let's go ahead and test this. Run. And so it's setting the table headers. Now it's setting all of the values one row at a time. Okay, well, it's done now. So let's go over into the HTML again, copy it, and let's paste it into our web page. Let's open that up. And here's what it looks like now. So to me, this just feels like what it needs to look like. The first row is the table header, and it's actually bolded, not because I set the style specifically for the first row to be bolded, but because the table headers are actually treated like table headers in this case, and that feels right to me. The last subflow that we need to go into is the send HTML email subflow, so let's go in there. Okay, so let's go over and find the Outlook section. Let's launch Outlook so that we can send an email. It's going to put the Outlook instance variable there. I want to close Outlook at the end. It's going to use the same instance. And then we want to send email message through Outlook. The account that I'm going to use is Dave, the RPA guy at gmail.com. And then I'm going to send to Dave, the RPA guy at gmail.com. The subject, we'll just call this test from pad. And then the body, we will put the HTML. HTML. Just like that. We need to check this to say that the body is HTML so that it doesn't just send it in plain text. 
and that'll be it. We'll save this and then we'll test it end to end. Here we go. Let's actually run this from this view because it'll be a lot faster. Here we go. We do want to use this location. Let me go ahead and delete those actually. I delete everything from this folder so that we know for sure it's going to be able to create a new one. It's going to take a second to get started up, but then when it's once it gets going, it's going to be super fast. Okay, so it's going too fast for me to even point out that what it's doing. All right, it's already sent the email. So here's something too I want to point out. If you use Outlook from Power Automate Desktop at least, um, whenever it sends an email and then it goes to close Outlook, it's going to say that you have messages in your outbox. Do you want the message to be sent? Then it'll pop up saying that it'll exit in 20 seconds or something. And you could just let this go. I think this is perfectly fine. Um, and it'll just exit on its own like this at the end. And there you probably can't see it, but my outlook just closed. And let's go look at the email that we just received. Here's the email that we just received. So test from pad. And there we have our table headers that look nice and then all the data that's beneath it. And that looks fantastic to me. We can also go check our Excel data to make sure it went in there properly, but it obviously did because we made that dependency. So it, you know, it actually reads the data back from Excel before sending through Outlook. This is my response for Robert's use case to first query SQL Server, write the data to Excel, read the data out of Excel, and then convert to an HTML table and then send through Outlook as an email. Thanks so much for the suggestion, Robert. I hope everybody has enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.